This is the BBC, with the Daily Minutes podcast. Oh no it isn't. I mean this is the Daily Minutes podcast. This is however not the BBC. Ik moet serieus een steviger microfoonstatief hebben, want dat ding dat is zeer irritant. Die gaat uh, alle richtingen uit en het kost moeite om hem vast te zetten. Maar de microfoon is te zwaar, denk ik, met uh, alle spullen die eraan hangen. De in het podcast, 16 september 2019, dit is het Brutten van Maandag. Ik heb vandaag niet super veel tijd uh, voor de uitzending. Ik uh, ben bezig om mogelijk een serie over QRP-werken uh, voor te bereiden... Ik heb daar al iets van uh, geschreven. Dus even kijken of dat uh, inderdaad wat wordt. En dat zou ik dan de komende dagen uh, gaan brengen. Ik wil wel iets meer tijd hebben dan vandaag. Wat ik nog niet uh, gebracht heb, dat is... Uh, ik had zaterdag geen uitzending. De uitzending van TX uh, Factor van het uh, RCB Nieuws. Die ga ik vandaag uh, brengen. En nou, als het een klein beetje lukt, dan kom ik morgen met de eerste aflevering over QRP. Vandaag geen nieuw uh, beeldmateriaal trouwens. Uh, er is gewoon uh, geen tijd voor. Hello, this is Mike Marsh, G1I AR, here with the TX News podcast of the GB2RS National News for Sunday the 15th of September 2019, supplied by the Radio Society of Great Britain and brought to you by TX Factor. The news headlines this week, Larry E. Price, Whiskey 4, Romeo Alpha, Silent Key. Bulgarians get digital segment on 6 meters and the RSGB NRC aerial improvements. It's with great sadness that the IARU reports that AWRL and IARU President Emeritus Larry E. Price, Whiskey 4, Romeo Alpha, died on the 10th of September. He was 85. The IARU owes a great debt of gratitude to Larry for his tireless work over the decades to represent the interests of amateur radio in regulatory forums. Larry was first licensed as Whiskey November 5 Tango India Alpha at 16 years old. He served four two-year terms as AWRL president, serving simultaneously as secretary of the International Amateur Radio Union in 1989 to 1992 and continuing as IARU secretary and AWRL International Affairs vice president until his election as IARU president in 1999. He served as IARU president for two five-year terms, retiring and being named IARU president emeritus and the IARU administrative council in 2009. The AWRL board named him AWRL president emeritus in 2011 and the amateur radio community expresses its deep felt sympathy to Larry's family at this very sad time. Bulgarian radio amateurs have obtained temporary access to the digital portion of the 50 MHz band, 50.310 to 50.335 MHz. Previously, their allocation was restricted to just 50.05 to 50.2 MHz, which excluded digital usage such as FT8. A key objective to WRC19 is to extend 50 MHz access to all countries across Region 1. The RSGB National Radio Centre at Bletchley Park has successfully completed the realignment of the Step IR beam this week. The Yesu rotator is now back in action and the Step IR beam can be rotated. The D-Star repeater Golf Bravo 7 Bravo Papa is also now back online and fully operational. Don't forget RSGB members can download a free entry to Bletchley Park and take your licence with you. You'll get the opportunity to operate GB3RS whilst you're there. Go over to the website at rsgb.org slash bletchley hyphen park hyphen voucher and you'll get all the details up there. The RSGB convention takes place in Milton Keynes from the 11th to the 13th of October. The provisional program of lectures and workshops is now online at rsgb.org slash convention. In the talk, I can hear it. Why won't it decode? 
Neil Smith, Golf 4, Delta, Bravo, November, will discuss how do you choose the best digital mode for tropospheric DX at VHF and above. He'll investigate the effects of multipath, scintillation, scatter modes, and the radio characteristics of signal coherence and decodability. Full details of all the tickets, the weekend packages, and the build-a-thon can be found online at rsgb.org slash convention. Three more RSGB 2018 convention videos have been released to the RSGB YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash the RSGB. John Warburton, Golf 4 India Romeo November, talks about an HFD expedition to the Andaman Islands. Bob Hansen, Oscar Zulu 2 Mike, looks at Arduino, GPS, RF and Psy5351 Alpha for radio amateurs and Chris Tran, Golf Mike 3 Whiskey Oscar Juliet, looks at transmit receive switching times and why they matter. Golf Bravo 7 Hotel Zulu in Strabane, Northern Ireland, is a multi mode digital repeater and is now active on DMR, D Star, and Yesu Fusion. Reports are welcome to the repeater keeper Michael Conahan, Mike India Zero, Hotel oscar zulu the next edition of radcom basics will be available at the end of this month september this edition will look at the rsgb awards in particular for the foundation license moving up intermediate and advanced licenses using digital repeaters and how and why the hf bands come alive in the autumn RSGB members can read previous editions of Radcom Basics by going over online to rsgb.org forward slash radcom hyphen basics. You can register to receive notification of subsequent issues as they become available. They will appear at the same internet address. Each edition of Radcom Basics explores key aspects of amateur radio in a straightforward way. Radcom Basics is sent as an email alert to subscribers when each edition is published and the email provides a list of contents and a link to the articles on the RSGB website. There goes your headline news. Now it's time to look at details of rallies and events for the upcoming week. Sunday the 15th, the West Tyrone ARC rally is going to be held at Omar Rugby Club at 7 Mellon Park Drive in Omar. Postcode is Bravo Tango 785 November Echo. The doors open at 11 in the morning and admission will cost you £3. There will be a talk-in station, trade stand, special interest groups, a bring and buy and an RSGB bookstore. Catering and a licensed bar are available on site and a prize draw will take place too. Get some more information from Philip. Call his mobile 07849 zero two five seven six zero next sunday the 22nd it's the western supermare radio rally held at the campus on highlands lane in western supermare where the postcode is bravo sierra 24 7 delta x-ray doors open from 10 till 3 and entry is three pounds there'll be trade stands and a bring it by plus excellent catering and a large car park too if you'd like some more information get in touch with dave dyer on his mobile 07871034206 also next sunday the 22nd the belgium amateur radio and computer rally takes place at the Louvexpo in la louvière in belgium open from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon talk in in is on the local FM, DMR and D-Star repeaters. There'll be trade stands from the UK, Holland, Germany and France and a flea market thrown in too. All the details are up online. Head over to Oscar November 6 Lima Lima dot BE. And if you've got stuff going on next year, now is a very good time to send it to us. Details of your 2020 rally and event plans. We need to hear about them. Get those in via email if you could as soon as possible to radcom at rsgb.org.uk. Let's look at the DX News now from 425DX News and other sources. The Latvian team on Nauru between the 16th to the 25th of September will be signing Charlie 21 Whiskey Whiskey instead of Charlie 21 Whiskey. Tina, Hotel Bravo Zero slash Delta Lima 5 Yankee Lima and Fred, Hotel Bravo Zero slash Delta Lima 5 Yankee Mike 
will be active from Massesha in Liechtenstein from the 20th of September to the 5th of October. Now, they'll be operating CW plus RTTY, especially during the CQWW DX RTTY contest. And there may be some SSB on the 160 to 6 metre bands too if you get a contact QSL via their home calls or direct or via the Bureau. Giuseppe Italy Kilo 5 Whiskey Whiskey Alpha will be active as Italy Mike Zero Delta Alpha Echo from San Pietro Island, which is Echo Uniform 165, between the 16th and the 28th of September. It'll also be on the HF bands as well as 6 metres, 2 metres, and 70 centimetres. QSL is via Italy Kilo 5 Whiskey Whiskey Alpha, direct or via the Bureau. Harry, Juliet Golf 7, Papa, Sierra, Juliet will be active holiday styly as Whiskey Hotel Zero, Romeo Uniform from Saipan, which is Oscar Charlie 086. Now that's going to be between the 15th and the 22nd of September. He will be operating CW, SSB and RTTY on the 40 to 10 meter bands. QSL is via Logbook of the World or you can do it direct to Juliet Golf 7, Papa, Sierra, Juliet. And Chip, Kilo Bravo 1, Quebec Uniform will be QRV as 9 Golf 5, Quebec Uniform from Ghana until the 21st of September. He'll be on 40, 30 and 20 metres using CW and digital in the QSL manager. There is November 4, Golf November Romeo. Special events news time now and the Thames Amateur Radio Club will operate Golf Bravo to Mike Foxtrot Mike on Sunday the 15th to raise awareness of military sites, particularly in Essex and Kent. Golf Bravo 2, Mike Foxtrot Mike will be at a World War II pillbox at Watt Tyler Country Park near Basildon. This month marks the centenary of radio in the Cambridge area, as well as a celebration day to be held on the 29th of September at Foxton, to which all local amateurs are invited. Local clubs have activated the call sign Golf Bravo 1 Charlie Alpha Mike and will be operating it throughout September. All the details are up online, by the way. Head over to cdarc.org.uk. Oscar Lima 75 Carbon celebrates the 75th anniversary of dropping the carbon paratroops in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia during World War II, known as Operation Carbon. It'll be on the air until the 30th of November and all the details are up on qrz.com. In memory of those lost in the Operation Market Garden, the South Dorset Radio Society will be operating from the wartime glider base at Tarrant Rushton, which is near Blandford in Dorset. They aim to be on the air from Tuesday the 17th right through until Friday the 20th of September, and they'll be using the call sign Golf Bravo Zero Mike Kilo Tango. Southgate ARC will be taking part in Railways on the Air on the 21st and 22nd of September from the Hoddesdon Model and Railway Club at Broxbourne Meadows. They'll be using the call sign Golf Bravo 4 Hotel Mike Romeo. Volunteers, operators and anyone interested are more than welcome to come along. And don't forget, send your special event details in via email to radcom at rsgb.org.uk as early as you possibly can so we can give you the free publicity you deserve and do remember it is a licensing condition that stations using a UK special event call sign must be open to the public. Now, if you are a contester, high time we took a look at the contest news for this week. It's a very busy time for contests this weekend. The WAEDX SSB contest runs for 48 hours, ending at 23.59 UTC on Sunday the 15th. Using the 3.5 to 28 MHz contest bands, the exchanges signal report and serial number and EU stations only work non-EU stations. The UK Microwave Group contest runs 0900 to 1700 UTC on Sunday the 15th. It's on the 24 to 76 gigahertz bands using all modes. The exchange's signal report, serial number and locator. The IRTS 70 centimetres counties contest runs 1300 through 1330 on Sunday the 15th. It's immediately followed by the IRTS 2 metres counties contest and that runs 1330 through 1500 UTC. Both contests use SSB and FM and the exchange is signal report and serial number with EI 
and GI stations also giving their county. The BARTG Sprint 75 contest runs from 1700 through 2100 UTC, Sunday the 15th, on the 3.5 to 28 MHz contest bands using RTTY only. The exchange is just your serial number. And finally, for Sunday the 15th, the 70 MHz AFS contest runs 0900 through 1200 UTC using all modes, the exchange's signal report, serial number and locator. Looking further into next week, Tuesday, the 1.3 GHz UK activity contest takes place from 1900 through 2130 UTC. Using all modes on the 1.3 GHz band, the exchange's signal report, serial number and locator. And on Wednesday, the 80 meter Autumn Series contest runs up from 1900 through 2130 UTC. Using CW only, the exchange's signal report and serial number. And on Thursday, the 70 MHz UK Activity Contest runs 1900 through 2130 UTC. Using all modes, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. And finally, on Sunday, the Practical Wireless 70 MHz Contest runs 1200 through 1600 UTC. Using all modes, the exchange is signal report, serial number and locator. And that's next Sunday, by the way. All right, let's do the radio propagation report now, wrapping up the main news. It's compiled this week by Golf Zero Kilo Yankee Alpha, Golf 3 Yankee Lima Alpha, and Golf 4 Bravo Alpha Oscar on Friday, the 13th of September. It was a quiet week, geomagnetically speaking, with the KP index generally not rising above 2. But a lack of sunspots didn't help HF propagation, which was decidedly uninspiring. There were some highlights, though, mostly on FT8. Columbia was decoded on Wednesday evening on 15 metres at a time when CW and SSB users might have thought the BAM was dead. FT8's ability to dig out signals that are way below the noise level is saving the day in terms of DX being workable. On a brighter note, in a new paper, scientists predict that the current solar cycle 24 will end in the first half of 2020, kicking off the growth of solar cycle 25 very shortly after. The paper from the US National Center for Atmospheric Research is based on a new theory that tsunamis of plasma race through the sun's interior and trigger the birth of the next sunspot cycle. Meanwhile, NOAA predicts that next week the solar flux index will remain low, with an estimate of around 68 to 70, and a total lack of Earth-facing coronal holes is also good news, with the KP index remaining at around 2. Finally, we're starting to see the gradual change to autumnal HF conditions, which will bring better DX over the next couple of months. The PropCrest site shows that the maximum usable frequency was now hitting more than 18 megahertz over a 3,000 kilometre path at times, so 17 metres is becoming quite usable as we exit the summer doldrums. It's also still showing an uplift in the critical frequency after dark on most days, which could bring some DX surprises. Moving up to the VHF and upwards propagation news, this coming week will suit VHFers who like to rise early, so set those alarms to get the best DX opportunities. The week will start with high pressure over the country, and except for a brief period when low pressure moves across the far north of Britain this Saturday, the 14th, it's pretty much a tropo story all the way. When there is still summer warmth around, it's worth noting that the strong lift conditions in the early morning usually fade as the temperature rises, so it's pretty much an early bird that catches the worm for tropo. Last Friday saw moon apogee when it's at its furthest point from Earth, and moon declination goes positive today, so EME conditions will improve as the week progresses. The moon will rise higher in the sky at zenith, and it'll be about 50 degrees elevation in southern england in the early hours of thursday sky noise on 144 megahertz starts the week at a low of around 250 kelvin and path losses will fall there are no major meteor showers this week but the september epsilon perseids meteor shower which is a minor one though past its peak continues to be active until the 21st of september check the early hours before dawn for the best random meteors and that is it for 
your propagation news from the propagation team this week and that's your gb2rs national news for the uk from around the world this week too regional gb2rs news is on the air of course all through the weekend well sunday anyway all you got to do is track down your local newsreader if you'd like to find out who is reading all the big stories that are close to you if you don't know who's reading the news why don't you head over to the tx factor homepage at txfactor.co UK. Click on the GB2RS News tab and up there you will find a PDF file with an up-to-date listing of all the broadcasters up and down the country for all the regions and it will tell you there what band they're on, what frequency they use, what mode they use and they are available on analog, digital, HF, VHF, UHF, you name it. GB2RS is broadcast all over the place. All you've got to do is track down your local newsreader and where he's doing it. I'll leave that one with you then. I'm Mike Marsh, G1IR, reporting with the TX News weekly podcast of GB2RS. Thank you for listening. We'll see you back here next week with the very latest update of GB2RS News. This is The Doctor Is In, your bi-weekly podcast that discusses all things technical and not so technical. The Doctor Is In podcast is produced by ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and sponsored by DX Engineering, helping you shrink the globe. See their website at www.dxengineering.com. And now, here's your host, QST editor Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and the doctor himself, Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Hello, I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY. And I'm Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Joel, I want to talk about coaxial connectors because we all know that there are many of them out there. Not all necessarily that hams use day in and day out, but there's certainly a collection that you know, your average ham is, is likely to run into. And for example, the so-called, and I put quotes around this, UHF connector, right? That's absolutely right. Most amateur gear operating through HF into Six and two meters are connected to their antenna systems via UHF series coaxial connectors. And the UHF series includes the popular PL259 plugs and oh, yes. SO239 sockets. I don't know why they don't both have the same numbers, but they don't. No, I always wondered about that. <laughs> somebody in the, I thought you were going to tell me why. but Well, because somebody in the military didn't notice that they were having two different lists, and they <laughs> that one came next. And there are other variations, of course. Uh, those refer to the standard types, but there are many other variations of both plugs and sockets that you'll run into. And these are mainly popular because they've become a, a de facto standard in spite of their deficiencies, of which there are a number we'll talk about. But it's important to understand where they came from. They were now you're a, talking about the PL259 as far as its deficiencies. and Well, being... the whole UHF series oh, okay. as a class have some negative um, negatives associated with them, as, as most of us do. <laughs> <laughs> but it helps to understand where they came from. In the days before coaxial cable. I have equipment that uh, has antenna terminals with fan stock clips. Remember them? Oh, yeah. And some, and many with screw terminals and so forth. Mm -hmm. And those were used to connect wires or wire transmission lines to radios, typically before World War II. At that time, the ultra highs in terms of frequency refer, referred to frequencies above 30 megahertz. Yes. So if we were to rename them now, the uh, what we called the ultra highs then would be called the very highs now the vhf range 30 to 300 megahertz and we would probably call the connectors vhf connectors not uhf connect well they were U it was uhf to the people at the time exactly right ultra high but yes and they they kept the name because that was their name and yeah <laughs> they still called that so they're not really appropriate very much for uhf use although sometimes you'll see them used on 70 centimeter equipment i have yeah, yeah. Uh, and one of the major limitations is that they are not a constant impedance connector that is to say the ideal connector looks like it isn't there to electrically to something. So if you had a coaxial cable with a 50 ohm characteristic impedance, what you'd really want to have is a 50 ohm connector that that continues that characteristic impedance, and that's easy enough to do with having the right uh, size center conductor and, and shield and um, space in between. But they didn't. They either didn't know or didn't care at that point, or it didn't matter much. And in fact, it doesn't matter if the frequency is low enough in the HF or into the low VHF range. You do get a mismatch, but it 
it changes very quickly back to the other impedance and the transformation of anything through that short length is very small. But if you get up into a high enough frequency, the transformation can cause the standing wave ratio of the transmission line extending below that point to be higher and cause a significant loss or, or have uh, cause problems for, for constant impedance equipment that's designed to work into a 50 ohm load. Kind of like a big speed bump in a parking lot. Very much so. Usually what that means in a practical sense is for a non-critical application on two meters, UHF connectors are usually okay. Although if you're into moon bouncing for every last decibel, you probably don't want to put up with UHF connect. And certainly at uh, 70 centimeters, they're not ideal because they're getting to be long enough to be a significant fraction of a wavelength. So the impedance transformation uh, becomes more significant. And that results in, in problems. The extent of the problem depends on how fussy you are. If you're working a 70 centimeter mobile station, 440 megahertz um, dual bander kind of thing in your car and have a 10 foot length of coaxial cable to some kind of mag mount antenna on your fender, you won't notice the additional loss probably and the equipment will be happy working into the whatever impedance it has. But again, with uh, if you're investing in a serious antenna system for long range propagation, you don't want to waste power unnecessarily and the easy way to avoid that is by changing connector type. So what do you use? Can I guess? <laughs> Well, there are a number of choices. Go ahead. What's your guess? My guess is an N connector. Am I right? That would be my first choice. Yes, the N connector is very good. Now, it's important to note that um, there are a couple of other problems with UHF that we should UHF connectors we should mention. One of them is, unlike the N connector, the UHF relies on the back shell to make the connection to the shield, which means if it loosens up, as it will always do in the trunk of your car, in my experience, yes, you end up with a poor connection in an intermittent situation as you bounce along the road. Always tighten the UHF connector back shells with a pair of gas pliers and just a little bit of a twist. You don't want to uh, deform them, but just enough to make them really snug, and they'll tend to stay together. Another problem with UHF connectors is that they're not waterproof. So if they're no. outside, you need to waterproof them to keep water out of them because not only does the water get into the connector, which can be a problem, but it also can penetrate into the coax, and that can degrade the coax very quickly compared to not having water. It sure can. In yeah. fact, you know yesterday when I was taking my cables down, as I was explaining to you, because my big spruce tree had to come down, there was a length of LMR 400 coax. And do you know that water had gotten into that? And there was actually a drip of water <laughs> when I unhooked the connector and a gray sort of uh, corrosion. That's uh, that's amazing. And um, it probably did not improve its uh, loss characteristics. No, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's good to keep water out of coax. Oh, yes. <laughs> And we could, that's sort of another topic, but we could... Uh, we should talk about that sometime, yeah. keeping water out of coax. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes up a lot. I get a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions that cause me to answer about water and coax, <laughs> even though that might not have been the thrust of the question. So a Type N connector solves all those problems. It's a constant impedance connector, and they're available in both 50 and 75 ohm impedances, which is a little bit of a concern because they're not compatible. If you plug a 50, the, the 50 ohm has a larger center conductor and a larger center conductor pin than the 75 ohm. If you plug a 50 ohm plug into a 75 ohm uh, socket, you will spread the pins and uh, once in my life, I've encountered a situation in which a nicely snugged up type N plug in a type N socket was not making contact. And it turned out to be a non-appropriate impedance interconnection. So uh, that, that doesn't usually happen. Usually there's enough tolerance variation and, and shift of things that it makes contact. But it can happen, not just theoretically. I've, I've seen it happen that <laughs> I... The two will not make contact. And and you've damaged the uh, connector also, so you have to be careful about that. Now, fortunately, in the radio business, you almost always just see 50-ohm connectors. The 75-ohm connectors are typically used in video applications and cable TV applications and distribution. Kind of. but, but the type N connector is constant impedance, and the way the connection is made the, uh, while the back shell holds the whole thing together, the connection actually happens inside that through a different structure that can move a little bit without it causing to intermittent. And the uh, the usual type N, I say that because there are some that are made like UHF connectors, uh, but the usual type N that's made with a gasket in it is actually waterproof. So that's those are all benefits that uh, solve problems with UHF connector. And the type N connector is about the same size as a UHF connector. They're assembled somewhat differently. And arguably, once you've done it a few times, the N is actually easier to do. You don't have the problem of, of, uh, of sweating the shield to the back shell of the outer side of the plug, for example. 
Now, of course, crimping avoids that with either type. Now, in terms of frequency response, unlike the um, UHF connector, which Amphenol specifies as being up good up to 300 megahertz, um, they specify the type N as being good up to 11 gigahertz and oh. under some conditions up to 18, huh. which is a whole different uh, realm. Now, the disadvantage of the type N is that they can't handle quite the same amount of power Typically, if you think of the you have the Type N as, as being capable of handling 600 watts, that's a good power level up through the VHF and UHF range. Now, in addition to the Type N, there are a bunch of connector types that use the same exact connecting arrangement as the Type N, even though they look differently and they're not compatible with each other. The BNC is probably the most uh, commonly encountered uh, of this sort. It's a bayonet connector that's smaller, and it's a very handy size for RG58, RG8X, and so forth, and they're available for those types of cables. And it has that neat locking function. Yeah, it's a, it's a very easy to use. It's wonderful for patch cables because they're so oh, yeah. easy to disconnect. But tell me, what does it mean, BNC? Yeah. One guy told me British Naval Connector. I'm no. not sure I'm buying that. I believe the real answer is uh, people's names, and I can't think of that. Ah. But B may stand for bayonet. Okay. <laughs> bayonet, somebody, somebody. Somebody will write in and tell oh, us. Oh, no doubt. I've got a bunch of mail about that. And I, I looked that up one time. I actually found it. This, it is possible. But that's not the only one. There's also a TNC, which looks just like a BNC and is the same size, but has a threaded that's right. outer back shell. So that's, again, handy for the smaller cable size. Now, you can get the connectors going either way. You can get ends for small cable, and you can get BNC for large cable, but somehow BNC and a large cable never look quite right to me. No. There's also one you almost never see in amateur circles, and I don't understand why, and that's the Type C connector. I never see that. Which is like a Type N, except it's a bayonet. So it's a larger size bayonet connector. Huh. Now, again, all these have the same electrical arrangement, size and size. They all have the same power rating and so forth. And they're all waterproof and they're all constant impedance. One thing about the Type N, because they're fairly popular with amateurs, some manufacturers, Amphenol in particular, have a series at lower prices than their usual commercial ones. That I haven't seen anything about them that makes them look less expensive or work less well than the more expensive ones, but they do have uh, lower price and plugs and sockets intended for amateur use. There was one I wanted to ask you about because it's popping up, at least uh, when it comes to handheld transceivers. Oh, the, yeah, SMA. the SMA. Yes, yeah. I was going to mention that. Now, that was intended for semi-rigid microwave cables, <laughs> yeah, mainly uh -huh. in equipment. I've seen that over the years and radars and so forth. They're designed to be infrequently disconnected. Infrequently? Yeah. Okay. And they should be wrench-tightened to be secured properly. <laughs> Does that apply to your rubber duck antenna then? On well, your handheld or? I'm, I'm talking about what the connector is designed for. Oh, okay. Now, you put it on okay. a, on a um, handheld radio antenna, and you probably won't tighten it with a wrench. No. And probably, because it's a handheld antenna, it doesn't work all that well anyway, uh, it works well enough for what it's supposed to do, it won't matter if it's not perfectly connected. But personally, I prefer the uh, BNC connectors, mainly because not only are they easier to, to connect and disconnect, but they're easier to connect other things too. Now, I've got adapters from SMA to BNC. and I've, I've got a coffee cans of adapters that <laughs> I gave me once, which are very handy. Mine are in a big baggie. But they're not cheap. And uh, no. you know, the fewer kind of connectors you have to deal with, the better. But the other connector that's probably next most popular compared to the UHF is actually the lowly RCA connector. Oh, yes. Which is really, originally was designed as an audio connector, and only because Collins Radio decided to put it for the 100-watt KWM series of transceivers, gave it some credibility as an RF connector. And other people, uh, Drake, for example, uses it for, they don't use it for their 100-watt. They have a UHF no. for the 100-watt, but all their other interconnections between the R4 and the T4 series of radios use RCA connectors. So you'll find them for many applications at RF, and I've never seen them for more than about 100 watts. Of course, they have the disadvantage that any kind of a pulling motion will disconnect them. There's nothing that holds them together other than friction, unlike the uh, other connectors we've been talking about. So, But they, they seem to work, and they're a handy size, and they're very inexpensive. And in a pinch, you can use an audio cable that you buy at your local electronics dealer like we used to have around yeah. the corner. <laughs> Back in the day, yeah. Um, but they do work. I guess there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, some of them are made with a sort of like RF connectors in the sense that they have a back shell kind of arrangement around the shield. Worth. I'm not sure that their shield has as much integrity as a um, real coax connector, but at HF, they seem to work fine. Yeah, so, definitely. And there are other ca connectors, too, that you occasionally see and people ask me about. One of them that I've never used but seems sensible is a mini UHF. I don't think I've ever seen that. It looks just like a UHF, but it's about the size of a BNC. Okay. So it's a nice fit for... 
you know, RG8X or RG58 kind of cable. They may not be as popular in this country as in some other countries, but they seems like a sensible kind of thing. I've never seen any equipment provided with them, but there may be some out there. Hmm. And I'm sure there are many others that you'll run into, but, but those are the main ones that you see. Again, the UHF, uh, as long as you keep it snug and keep it waterproof, works fine at HF and will handle the legal limit. Oh, I should mention that uh, in addition to the Type N, which we said it you know tops out at about 600 watts in the higher frequency range, there's a Type HN, which is a larger version of the N, and that will handle the legal limit and will handle larger size coaxial cables more readily, like... RG17 or, or uh, some of the bigger high power cables. So if you're into the high power mode, you may want to look into HN as a connector option. Yeah, that Again, makes sense. They're, they're not cheap, but uh, nothing about high power is cheap usually. Not at all. Let's take our break and we shall return. Ever talk to a salesperson who didn't know the difference between a rotator and a rotary phone? Or a Yagi and a yo yo? Or a ballon and a ballerina? You'll never have that problem with DX engineering. When you call us, you'll talk directly with knowledgeable amateur radio experts, people who speak your language. When you contact DX Engineering, you're dealing with operators who are as passionate about the hobby as you are. This means better service, expert technical advice, and a commitment to your complete satisfaction, even long after your purchase has been made. Whether you're newly licensed or a long-time operator, you'll always find a friendly ham who understands exactly what you need on the other end of the line. Plus, you'll find a huge selection of amateur radio equipment, get the fastest shipping in the ham universe, and shipping is free on most orders over $99. Let's talk about your station. Visit us at dxengineering.com. That's dxengineering.com. And we are back, Joel, and we have a question from Sandy, WB4EVH. And Sandy's asking, I recently saw a local CBer assembling a circularly polarized antenna. At HF, would there be any advantage to circular polarization? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It doesn't come up very often, but we think of circular polarization often as, as um, associated with satellite communications on VHF and UHF because the satellites tend to tumble and rotate with a subsequent change in polarization, and having circular polarization avoids the fades that uh, result from that. But it actually came up long before satellites. Right after World War II, there was a problem with ground-to-air VHF communication because aircraft changed orientation during maneuvers, resulting in deep fades for the same reason. If you imagine uh, a fighter pilot doing uh, barrel rolls past the tower as he's <laughs> checking in, <laughs> his polarization will shift from vertical to horizontal as he rolls over. I ma- you mentioned that in a <laughs> relatively recent podcast. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. it's still probably true. <laughs> oh, I imagine. Sure. They probably don't let them do it anymore. But <laughs> most tower communication shifted to circular polarized antennas for VHF, which is uh, in that 120 megahertz range, similar to our two meter size antennas. The problem went away. Now, the downside is that there's a 3 dB loss compared to being on the same polarization, horizontal to horizontal or vertical to vertical. But the um, out of polarization, you know, uh, vertical to horizontal can be 20 or 30 dB, which is hard to copy. You know, that 3 dB loss is not a significant issue if you're talking about ground to air in the (laughs) vicinity of the (laughs) airport, so it doesn't really matter, but uh, it can matter for other applications. Now, with HF ionospheric communication, the polarization does shift with time. That's why people don't really worry about it. So you have HF um, horizontal and vertical antennas on different sides of an ocean talking to each other, and there's enough uh, energy in each polarization that the signal usually gets through without too much trouble. But there are fades, and one cause for fades is is the polarization ending up being cross-polarized from what you're expecting. So having circularly polarized antennas will reduce or eliminate fades due to that polarization shift. Now, unfortunately, that's not the only cause of HF fade. So going to circular polarization won't eliminate fading, but it'll eliminate fading due to that cause. You also have fading that results from uh, angle of arrival shift and uh, other things that that happen. Um, and at a serious um, government receiving site back in the days of radio teletype, I don't know if they still use that, but they have diversity reception for both uh, polarization and uh, angle of arrival using um, up to four receivers in that case, and possibly another four for a different frequency. So you have things going on. You shift between them to eliminate fades and get good reception. But most hams don't do that. But having a circularly polarized HF antenna does eliminate fades due to uh, polarization shift. And I've only known one ham. There are probably many others who have uh, actually done this seriously. And that was a mentor of mine back when I was uh, 12 or 13 years old, Bill Ellsworth, W1ZF, 
who was a um, broadcast engineer, I think for the Westinghouse Network's AM system. And he had an 80 meter vert vertical and an 80 meter dipole, horizontal dipole that he fed 90 degrees out of phase to get circular polarization. Huh. Actually operated from his station using, now I couldn't tell the difference, but uh, I was 13. Well, I was going to ask you, did it work? It worked. Now, what, how would it work with one or the other? I really need to do some switching pretty quickly oh, yeah. to tell, but it did work. You know, there's very little to say that you shouldn't do that other than if the polarization is coming in in one particular polarization, then circular polarization will be down somewhat from horizontal or vertical that matches what's coming in. But since it's shifting all the time and there's a combination of both, chances are that circular polarization on HF uh, reception will work just fine. And similarly, by transmitting it, you sort of avoid having it null out uh, at the other end as well. So, you know, I think it's it's not a bad idea. It might just be a lot of trouble. to set Well, I was just going to think, you know, how many... 80 meter antennas do you have room for in your yard? <laughs> you know, one is <laughs> much less cross polarizing. Yes, them, exactly. Yes. Well, that was informative, Joel. Thank you. My pleasure. If you have a question for the doctor, email us at doctor at ARRL.org. The Doctor is in podcast is sponsored by DX Engineering at www.dxengineering.com. Background music provided by Purple Planet at www.purple planet.com. This podcast is copyright ARRL. All rights are reserved. Until next time, I'm QST Managing Editor Becky Schoenfeld, W1BXY, 73, and thanks for listening. Title music is by Croatian artist Blasco and is published under Creative Commons. You can find this podcast on dmpodcast.net, DM is for daily minutes, and on several other platforms. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl. 70 mhzshop.nl. Daily Minutes Podcast. Whoever hears this is crazy. En microfoon naar de tour.